completing some car kind of regression soon. And these 18 months of the pandemic have been intense for everyone. And I want to speak about what lessons we have learned and what lessons we haven't learned and we should learn uh, in this time. And uh, I mean, right now there are cases growing in the United States, in Mexico, in Russia, the UK, France, Spain, Italy, Netherlands, Indonesia, Portugal, Belgium, Israel, Japan, Vietnam, Thailand, and many other countries. Uh, so one might wonder whether we have learned something if, if we are going again through an increase in cases. Uh, however, countries like uh, Poland, Hungary, Bahrain, Singapore, Iceland, New Zealand, and, and others have controlled their cases in, in recent months. So they show that it is possible to control the pandemic. Uh, and we shouldn't ignore the good decisions these countries have made. And we shouldn't ignore the mistakes most of the other countries have made. So I, I think we can reflect on all these issues. Uh, and also because if we, we had to start again from scratch, uh, right now or, or in a few years with COVID or with another virus or with another disease, uh, would we repeat the same mistakes or not? Um, uh, and I mean, this is not the first outbreak we face uh, in recent years. We've, we've had the first SARS, MERS, Ebola, uh, influenza, Zika, and many others. And let's say with those outbreaks, we didn't reach the criticality we are having now, but it seems it's not so much because we made less mistakes, but because the viruses uh, or the diseases were not uh, so problematic for, because of their own properties, we, we managed to, to handle them and contain them better. Um, but there's nothing that tells us that uh, SARS-CoV-2 will be the worst virus we will face. Either variants or uh, completely new virus could be uh, either more contagious or more deadly or both. So what, what can we do um, in spite of having uh, learned uh, from our history that these things could happen? And uh, maybe we were a bit prepared, but certainly not enough. So what, what can we do? And uh, I, I will categorize the different lessons that we have learned or we should be learning uh, on epidemiology, society, politics, cognition, values, and global challenges. So for epidemiology, um, just like wars uh, tend to accelerate technological development, pandemics seem to accelerate the health sciences. Uh, so the speed at which research has been made is, is amazing. We never had so much data about how a virus evolved. So this has promoted collaborations and also the technology for sequencing has decreased its cost, has accelerated as well. Uh, and we are learning many lessons and uh, we will learn many things analyzing all the data that we've had from how a virus evolves. Uh, we've never had so much information, so uh, I'm sure we'll learn much from that. And also uh, the, the vaccines that uh, were developed in, in record time, uh, we're seeing its benefits already. Uh, recently, there was announced a successful vaccine against malaria, and this could lead to saving more than uh, several hundreds of thousands of lives every year. And the same for influenza, HIV, and other diseases. Uh, vaccines could uh, help us curb them in ways that, let's say, the research was not so accelerating as, as it has been uh, because of the pandemic. And the social aspects have been extremely complicated. They have reflected inequity uh, that, just like with other diseases, poor people and poorer countries have higher risks. So for example, some friends from New York City told me that the rich people uh, in the first wave simply left the city and that left many uh, people without the means uh, in, in the city and it was a very tense situation and the crime rates increased. So that increased many social problems that were latent in, in society. Uh, and it, it seems it's also um, showing the relevance of having proper social security. 
and uh, I mean, not every country has uh, these benefits. So it seems it's really important that um, this is promoted in, uh, worldwide. And, and another problem was the dilemma that we are still being told between health and economics and uh, work of Cecile Philippe and others at the Institut Economique Moinari uh, in France, they, they show that uh, it's not dilemma, they, they go together. If your people are dying, your economy will suffer and vice versa. Uh, so the, the countries that have managed the pandemics best are those that are doing best in, in, in their economies. And also the different situations uh, that the pandemic has uh, created uh, show the, whether we, we will be more selfish or um, more solidarious towards others, um, not only at the local level, but at the global level. Uh, so I'm sure there are many questions and ethics uh, dilemmas that will be discussed from this. And one of these has to do with freedom. Uh, and it seems there is a big misunderstanding of what freedom means. Uh, I mean, if, if there's a war and there's a bombing uh, and there are curfews, uh, people will fight to go out in the streets while there's a bombing because it's their freedom to go out. Or, uh, I mean, the fact that cigarette smoking was um, restricted in public uh, spaces was precisely because it showed that uh, Secondhand smoking uh, is a uh, trigger for cancer. So it, it's not your own decision whether, okay, if I smoke, uh, I assume the risk. You're putting other people at risk. So uh, it's like we have social norms, and that's part of having freedom to follow those uh, norms. Uh, and putting other people at risk, it's uh, on the same level of uh, criminal activities. So it's, it's not a matter of freedom. It's like if people start saying, oh, why cannot steal and rape and murder? What about my freedom of doing all that? Uh, I mean, it's you know, on the same level. Um, it seems that some people want more freedom, but less responsibility. And of course, uh, th this has to be clarified because many people are still confused about this. And um, the, the politicization of global challenges like the pandemic uh, adds an extra layer of complexity. And it, it's quite a challenge to develop solutions independently on local and global power gains because uh, at the end, decision makers are politicians and they decide how the pandemics will be tackled in, in their cities, in their states, in their countries. Uh, and it, it's, it's a valid question whether politicians should make these decisions, uh, not only because they are not experts in epidemiology or whatever global problem they're deciding on, uh, but they have uh, different priorities. Uh, I mean, in, in democracies, the politicians are more interested about um, being reelected, for example, or interest of their party or their not to make voters unhappy. And we should really think whether we want these people to make decisions uh, on, on questions that require more uh, scientific guidance. And of course, it's difficult to cooperate in a country where if whatever action uh, the government will make will be criticized by the opposition, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, they will be criticized. So it, it's just um, the the power struggles that many countries uh, have within them because of democracy uh, have limited the, the response to, to the pandemic. And this means that we need a change in political organization. And of course, democracy is the best game in town so far, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. And I, I will speak more about this towards the end. Uh, about our limited human cognition, uh, I mean, we will have hundreds of cognitive biases and we make mistakes all the time. And we fall victims of collective misbelief and we are irrational and we're unable to, to measure risk properly. So th th those are 
uh, many things that work against us in such situations. Uh, we cannot make the right decisions. So it, it becomes a, a question whether we should let someone else make decisions for us, let it, the government, big brother, or algorithms, or scientists, or companies. Uh, should we let them make decisions for us if uh, we know that we are limited and we make mistakes, but everyone makes mistakes. Also the, these people and algorithms and everyone makes mistakes, uh, especially when there's no best answer. Uh, I mean, with, with COVID-19, all the options are terrible. It's, it's like uh, damn if you do and damn if you don't. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to, to have lockdowns. It's very difficult to have hospitals overflow. And whatever decisions you will take, you will be criticized because it's a bad <laughs> situation. So, of course, it, it's not uh, easy to agree on something when we don't know uh, for sure uh, or we don't trust that it, it's the best possible uh, option that we have. And, of course, this raises the question, what's the best possible balancing between delegating decisions and assuming our own decisions? Uh, and of course, for coordinating at the global level, for solving global problems, uh, it's much more difficult if everyone assumes decisions or if the governments delegate the decisions of public health to the criterion of, of citizens, because everyone, uh, many citizens will make mistakes. And, and of course, this implies several ethical issues, and this leads us to also which values we have. Uh, and the, having so many deaths worldwide uh, raised the question of, of how much is a human life worth. And of course, uh, we cannot accept utilitarian uh, perspective, but also we cannot accept that it has an infinite, infinite value. So we, we need to discuss more how can we measure uh, the, the value of human life uh, from an ethical perspective in, in order to be able to make better decisions. And of course, the pandemic reminds us that we are finite and uh, we will die sooner or later. So of course, instead of uh, say suffering from the situation, let's take advantage of whatever time we have and do the best we can with our lives and accept the situation as it is. Uh, what we cannot change, uh, let's say, we should just accept uh, and try to do the best we can within our space of possibilities. And uh, many people uh, in January 2020, uh, like Yanni Bariam or Nassim Taleb, were uh, warning everyone about the risks that the, the, the virus was raising uh, and many people were saying, oh, why do, why do you panic? And it, it's, it's good to panic, but not to worry, uh, in the sense that uh, it's better to be overcautious and to say, okay, we overmeasure the risk rather than we undermeasure the risk as we did. Uh, so for example, if international flights from China would be canceled uh, when the outbreak was announced, then uh, it would have been contained in China uh, and we wouldn't be uh, having all the situation that we have now. And of course, for the things we can change, uh, we, we, sh we shouldn't worry. Um, and finally, the, the global challenges that uh, we're facing, not only pandemics, climate change, economic problems, migration, crime, terrorism, and so on, uh, it's in everyone's best interest to, to address them and to solve them, but how to do it? We, we need mechanisms to align uh, our actions and our decisions. International organizations have been created precisely with these purposes, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and so on. Uh, and they have had a certain success, but it has been limited because we need to coordinate at multiple scales, not only global, but also uh, national, regional, local and so on. And this is precisely the purpose of the World Health Network. So if we each do what's in our sphere of influence uh, to, to achieve this, we'll be in better position to address global challenges. And finally, just to say that global problems need global solutions. So if we don't have a global coordination, there's no hope in addressing these challenges.